Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ebony and uh, all of the um, Indiana Ignite team for inviting um, me here to present some of our thoughts as to how we are moving forward, uh, particularly based on some of the work that this group has already been doing in one of our safety net hospitals uh, in downtown Indianapolis. Also thank uh, all of the um, Ignite uh, board and um, of course Terry and, and um, Eric to um, invite me here to give a um, brief overview of what, uh, what is possible in a large health system if the health system were to adapt the principle that we could actually take genomic medicine and the findings of genomic medicine and try to make that part of our health system and healthcare uh, process. So just a brief uh, overview. Some of you may be familiar with uh, um, I, uh, IU and uh, IU Health. Um, what we have done over the last uh, three years is to really create a seamless enterprise that has actually merged the, um, the administration of the medical school and the administration of the hospital. Even though the hospital is a um, um, partially owned uh, uh, public corporation, um, many of the senior officers, in, including myself, uh, share dual roles. So I serve as the uh, dean for research at the School of Medicine, but also the executive vice president for um, innovation and research in the health system. Um, so the concept here is that we're actually merging both the academic and the discovery mission to uh, potentially healthcare mission. And, and uh, not that we are unique in that, but there are very many uh, schools that are trying to do that. Um, but I think one of the interesting aspects for us is that we do have a very huge reach and we essentially have the entire state uh, as a possible laboratory to explore this uh, opportunity. So this just gives you a, a simple uh, sort of overview of what IU Health is. IU Health is one of the largest HPOs uh, in the country, probably uh, I think ranked as the seventh or eighth largest now. Uh, it has about 19 hospitals that is spread across the entire state and uh, covers about 3 million uh, patient, uh, lives, um, probably about 45% of the state. So it's a very large healthcare system that has uh, obviously several um, high-end academic uh, so medical centers uh, in Indianapolis and surrounding areas, but also very many tertiary, uh, I would say, uh, sites that are uh, more critical care hospitals and uh, affiliated with those are over 100 community clinics and other types of uh, uh, service providers. So it provides us with a very uh, large canvas, if you will. And, and uh, uh, as part of our Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, or the, uh, which is another NIH-funded uh, um, program, we've now created a very large uh, sort of network of uh, uh, potentially both research, but also uh, what I would call um, uh, academic types of uh, service um, extensions. So we have a single IRB system for all of these hospitals. Um, we have a single EHR a data warehouse. It's a, a Cerner-based data warehouse um, that can um, essentially have data for all of these patients. And then we have at each of these hospitals and many of these sites, we have um, a space where patients can be uh, consented, patients' uh, uh, blood uh, samples can be taken, as well as uh, a, a single laboratory system that, pr that sends all of these uh, blood samples to a central path lab and a central um, area for essentially high-end tests like genomic medicine. And then we also uh, obviously have a statewide biorepository that can collect samples and store them um, within the um, medical center. So the infrastructure uh, is, is uh, implemented as is the, um, the system's uh, willingness to do that. Um, how do we, um, we, we, we then went on to actually create joint goals. Uh, a typical medical school goal, of course, is, 
is uh, to increase the number of programs, the number of funding, NIH funding, et cetera, um, which is not always very meaningful to the hospitals. They say, yeah, that's great, uh, but uh, you know, I'm more worried about revenue cycle and quarterly reports and, and patient flow and, and workflow. Um, so uh, we've created a joint uh, sort of goals for the enterprise, um, but particularly we are focusing on accelerating clinical protocols within the system that um, particularly uh, what we think would be beneficial to patients, those types of protocols would be given priority and will become system goal. What does it mean to become a system goal? Well, essentially what it means is that most of our uh, senior management, uh, the CEOs of all these hospitals and the CFOs, et cetera, um, their compensation is about uh, 40 to 50 percent based on performance. And research becoming one, these type of programs becoming one of the goals means almost 5 percent of their compensation depends on the success of these programs, which provides an incredible uh, motivation for the hospitals to actually make sure that they support the IT, they support the infrastructure, they provide space or the staff to do that. So that's been part of the strategy here, is to not only show the value of these types of uh, innovations, but also incentivize them to, uh, in some way, uh, make it happen at their sites. So the areas that we are focusing particularly Obviously, these are the big areas for most hospitals and healthcare system to uh, treat patients and, uh, and, and depend on the revenues. But one of the cross-cutting themes that we th the, we're thinking is extremely valuable is to focus on precision health. Um, obviously, there are others such as you know, population health, which is more on health services and health outcomes related types of metrics. But the, um, the top one, as you can see, is precision health. And we're defining precision health, at least at this point, primarily based on genomics types of information, uh, pharmacogenetics and other types of genomics as the, the primary way of uh, making it, I would say, more precise or uh, closer to precision at this point than anything else. Um, how are we moving this forward? Um, or, uh, currently, we, as I said, we're a Cerner shop, so we have... Um, Cerner in all of the hospitals and is, I would say, about 40 to 45 percent of our uh, non-hospital based clinical uh, service areas. And uh, we're using a tool, uh, if any of you are familiar with Cerner, you, you know there's a tool called Power Trials within that, that can actually tag patients that are either participating in a trial or potentially eligible for a trial. And uh, um, as I mentioned, we are at, uh, in the future, uh, our goal is to really have 20 impactful clinical trials that become preferred by the system and would become part of the system's goals. And all of our physician practices, all of our hospital CEOs will, will be able to then um, create a platform for pushing out these, uh, these trials. And uh, once the patient is enrolled or consented, there is a tag that shows up as this patient is participating uh, in this trial or is, is potentially eligible for the trial. Um, the question of you know, making physicians click on that if they're eligible is still a big challenge. But certainly once they are eligible, we, uh, uh, we can enroll them. Um, and, and once they're enrolled, they become tagged in, the, uh, in the, uh, their patient's electronic health record system. And if any of the physicians that actually see this patient in any setting click on this, then obviously you'll pull up the actual protocol they're on or even the consent and, and, and other uh, documents that would be appropriate. So um, by October, um, November period, we're, we're making the 20 impactful trials system-wide, but we have over seven that are now moving uh, out. And the number one, as, to, as I hope to tell you, would be um, the um, Ingenious, which is the Ignite uh, part of the um, uh, trial. We, we use the uh, Encore uh, clinical trials uh, software um, for actually entering the data. 
So uh, any patient that's enrolled in these trials will be entered into Encore, which uh, is now directly connected to Cerner. So every patient that's enrolled in any of these trials will automatically populate into uh, Cerner. The other thing that we can also do based on this Encore tool is that if we um, put the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the clinical trials, for the top uh, trials that we select, this will automatically search our electronic data warehouse and actually tag all the potentially eligible patients. And uh, we've uh, just rolled out three trials so far, and uh, those uh, um, searches can be done on a weekly basis, and that list then goes to the study coordinators who would know where these patients are within the system and are then able to um, uh, let the exact facility know how to enroll these patients. So as I mentioned, the, uh, one of the top trials we're moving forward with are the pharmacogenetic service to uh, patients. There are some other biobanking studies, um, but our, our goal in the long run is to move 20 trials. Um, but uh, um, the first one would be uh, Ingenious, which is the um, part of the IGNITE uh, trials. Uh, I think you just heard that this is a, um, a pharmacogenetics-based uh, randomized control trial. And the hope is that with the, with, at the end of this trial, we will be able to show that there is significant cost savings and uh, patient benefit using pharmacogenetically uh, based uh, decision support for, um, for particularly for prescription medications. I think this is becoming increasingly valuable within our system. Um, as you can see, this is the site that we use to um, actually educate providers, engage patients, or once they're enrolled, they can get uh, continued information about the, about the trials. Um, might uh, have seen this before, but um, already we're uh, beginning to report uh, substantial actionable results and uh, um, uh, consultation outcomes, um, but we hope this would be expanded to um, essentially uh, 2.5 million patients in addition to what's already been being done. Um, so um, our hope is that with this, we'll actually uh, be able to say, as a health system, we're providing uh, precision health, um, which you know, we're, we're broadly defining in, uh, for the system as both genetic, but also behavioral and environmental factors. Um, while we're just at the beginning of some of the other components, the behavioral and environmental component, we certainly feel like we're in a place ready to move some of the genetic stuff forward. Um, and, and this has, be, again, become also part of our entire university's, um, um, I would say, uh, goal. Um, Indiana University is going to be 200 years old in 2020. So as part of the 2020 uh, strategy, um, precision health has become one of the grand challenge initiatives that the university has embraced, um, which means that the, uh, the plan to invest substantial uh, resources to create uh, significant genomic discipline, uh, as well as some additional uh, actionable items like cell and gene therapies, uh, uh, the druggable genome and biological discovery based on that. And of course, uh, um, significant data sciences and informatics. So the uh, idea is to really uh, embrace this fully and make all of our health systems be part of a precision health uh, environment over the next uh, um, decade. Um, and, and as I, um, the two areas that we're uh, already making substantial uh, sort of investments. Uh, one is in pharmacogenetics, um, and, and the second one is uh, cancer genomics, as you would expect. Uh, this has become uh, increasingly more and more part of our clinical care. Um, so um, we're beginning, we're partnered with a uh, couple of different areas to sequence gene, uh, whole genome, uh, whole exome sequencing of tumors, and, and then based on that, uh, refining our chemotherapy regimen. Um, so right now we have um, several hundred, probably around 800 uh, cancer patients that have gone through this within the last two years. 
And uh, already within our system, we're seeing a substantial uh, benefit to patients in terms of their survival curves, uh, those that have been treated with genomic-based uh, chemotherapy regimen versus those that are using standard um, usual care uh, regimen. And, and this becomes part of the value that we can uh, provide to our patients. But at, from the system level, it also becomes a major market differentiator when you're trying to compete in a healthcare environment with other health systems in your market area. So I think with, we think this is a, uh, an important um, uh, move forward. And finally, one of the things that we're beginning to see um, also is some, some ways to address uh, health equity and health disparities. Um, one of the big examples, surprising examples for us, uh, we're still analyzing the data, is that uh, it turns out that uh, uh, breast cancer outcomes have been you know, reported uniformly poor, uh, as poor for African American women as opposed to uh, Caucasians. And uh, at least in our system, what we're finding is that African American women get much lower dose of Taxol because of some of the potential side effects. And uh, that may well be one of the major reasons why they show poor outcomes, because they don't get adequate um, high enough doses of uh, Taxol. So we're beginning to now use pharmacogenetics to actually look at uh, plasma levels to see if that can be uh, addressed. So there are many uh, potential ways. I think this, this approach uh, at a health system level can bring a lot of value and, uh, uh, and, and makes uh, b good uh, science, but also very intelligent business. So um, that's what we're excited about, and uh, we look forward to uh, partnering, obviously, with our academic partners and uh, NIH and other um, interested parties to make this a uh, reality. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anantha. Do we have some time for questions. And it looks like hands are already um, raised. Um, yeah. We have Eric and then Dan. Uh, sure. I, hi, that was very helpful. Thank you. Could you maybe just describe a little bit more? I was trying to understand sort of how the, the CTSA funding that you get for this. On one slide, you sort of showed it in the center, but I wasn't sure if this was sort of a, a critical part of it. Was sort of was it really the the center of the of your universe, or is it just a component part like yeah. other sources of funding? Yeah. So the CTSA has um, helped in several um, components of this. One. If, for example, starting with the single IRB for our entire hospital system, that was uh, one of the things that we did through the CTSI. The second area is the rolling out of Encore for all clinical trials, which we worked with the University Clinical Trials Office, which is part of the CTSI. So those are uh, two big ones that we have already used the CTSI resources for. And establishing some of our CLIA processes for uh, genome testing at, at all of these sites, uh, sample transfer from multiple peripheral sites, um, and, and uh, setting up SOPs for those kinds of processes at all of these sites have all been part of the CTSI regulatory program that's helped with us. So I think you know, we have sort of leveraged the health system and the NIH investment in the CTSI very nicely to create that, uh, that whole network across the state. And, and the universities in our CTSI, um, three of the univer uh, academic universities in Indiana are partners. It's Indiana University, but also Purdue University and, and Notre Dame. And Purdue has a lot of process engineers who have helped us uh, actually conduct a, Lean Six Sigma process to improve all of our process across the state. So I, I, I had a sort of a, a question in a similar vein, and, and, and maybe I can just sort of phrase it a bit differently and, and get a, a, a different sense of the answer. Of, do you, um, how much of an investment has the institution made the, and, and for you, the institution, I guess, is also the state and the CTSA and, and NHGRI. Can you sort of give us a, a numbers and, and, and how, so how much skin is, does each of those players have in this game? Um, and, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, I, I, I can't um, 
give you the exact amount of uh, NHGRI support, I think that's, that's pretty much through um, the IGNITE program primarily. Um, I, I, I can't say the health system has made um, huge investments in this. Um, right now, uh, we provide probably about um, uh, close to $3 million a year to maintain this infrastructure across the 19 hospitals. And this involves essentially um, uh, staff, uh, part-time nurses at these uh, different hospitals, uh, space utilization, as well as uh, probably about a million dollars of that goes to the electronic health or our IT systems to uh, to be able to do the re uh, required searches through the EDW to pull out the uh, the, the tracking and, and pushing out of the message, and that's just the uh, operating costs at this point. Um, we have, and obviously, the, the, the school has invested a substantial amount in the precision health um, in terms of uh, faculty development and faculty hires. Um, the other investments which are partially helping this are, you know, obviously the building out of the EDW and connection to all of the electronic health records. So while there is in-kind support of uh, several million dollars, there's actual direct support of um, um, about $3 million per year. Um, and, and the other thing that I would also mention is that this, we were able to talk to the state legislatures about this, um, and they were quite interested in this. So we, uh, are, through the CTSI, we actually got a, a $2 million line item in the state budget to help with this as well. So there's, there's substantial interest and investment in this. We have Jeff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sort of interested in the sociology of this, of this whole um, process of embracing precision health. Could you describe you know, whether you met with any resistance at all, and what did you promise would be the result at the end to get you this type of investment that you've been able to achieve? Yeah, the, it, it is um, part, of, part of this is, of course, the, the promise of what we think would be better patient care. And uh, while, you know, one can say, as Jeff, you know, uh, you, you can say this is going to solve all human health and really going to find all kinds of cures for every incurable disease, um, the short-term benefits really is... Uh, um, even cost savings aren't a big deal for the health system. They will say, well, you know, if I'm putting $3 million every year, uh, I could do that in another program and get, you know, 3x returns very easily. So I expect to justify that unless it's, it saves me 15 to $20 million. It's not worth my time to put $3 million. So I think that's, that's really not the only sell. We can say that certainly is going to save you some major... Um, adverse events and major um, benefits, but it'll be for a, subs a much smaller uh, patient uh, population. The biggest selling point for me was that this will be your market differentiator in the healthcare market so that more of the patients with these high-end uh, uh, sort of care-needing diseases like cancer, like cardiovascular diseases, like uh, people with uh, treatment-resistant uh, conditions, will come to you rather than go to your competitors because you are able to, even if you can't find the right treatment, you're able to give them a better answer than the other health systems. So that's been the biggest thing that's worked on the C-suites for me. Yeah. We have another question line. So I was kind of interested in the in, in a similar question, but maybe in the practical sense, I think you said something about incentivizing physicians for demonstrating innovation in genomic medicine broadly. Could you elaborate a little bit on how you measure that? Is it just enrolling people in immuno-oncology trials, or yeah. how, how do you yeah. see it? So right now, it's, it's fairly crude. Um, so what we're, uh, what we're saying is that these top 20 trials will have um, enrollment metrics for each of the systems and those enrollment metrics are based on eligible patients within that system. So every hospital or every clinic 
we can look at the EDW, see what percent of patients are at least based on the inclusion exclusion criteria are eligible. And our goal is to say, if you have 10 eligible patients, you would have been, you would have met your satisfactory metric if you've enrolled at least um, one patient within, out of that 10. And you would exceed your goal if you enrolled two patients. And that satisfactory metric actually determines 5% of the comp for many of the um, executives and also provides a research RVU for, uh, for physicians. So um, we're still refining that system, but it's relatively crude at this point. So yeah, if I could ask, uh, the, the research RVU is a, is a very interesting approach to incentivizing physicians. Uh, how, how, where do you get that money from to be able to provide it to them? <laughs> yeah, um, so what we've said is that everybody, uh, in order to get their um, clinical pay, they have to meet 80% of their clinical RVUs. The remaining 20% is met by either teaching RVUs or research RVUs. So you could do 100% clinical RVUs and not teach or not, not do any uh, research as affiliated activities, but it's a lot easier for them to help recruit patients and get that 20% um, RVUs. Well, and, and obviously it's very important for clinicians who want to do research um, yes. when, when yeah. they're being really pressured to get the yeah. value units up for, for clinical care. So yeah, that's great. We, we think that's really the value. It's a lot of our academic or clinical faculty uh, feel actually that they are, they're very excited to do this and they really, even the hospital CEOs really want us to give us all kinds of information how to roll this out because um, they're all interested and excited. It's, mostly protecting time. Thank you very much. As you see, everyone was very excited to hear about Thank the you. Indiana Health University. Talk. Thank you. Um, we next have Tony Poland, who is um, a PI um, at the University of Maryland. And she actually led a workshop um, engaging insurers and payers and um, other people from technology companies. That was not even two weeks ago. Um, and she's just going to give us feedback. Um, I just want to let you know this preliminary feedback because she hasn't got the input and written up, but she's going to give us feedback on what we heard um, that day. Thank you very much, Tony. <laughs> 